Good afternoon and welcome to the Terry Talks Nutrition Educational Webinar Series. Today's topic, the Lyme Disease Fibromyalgia Connection, and our very special presenter is Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum. We'll be getting started in about one minute. If you're having any technical difficulties, please call 866-569-3239. Thank you for your patience and we'll be starting in about one minute. Welcome everyone to the Terry Talks Nutrition Educational Webinar Series. Today's topic, the Lyme Disease Fibromyalgia Connection, how to get well now. Let's get started. Now for those of you who may not have joined us in the past, I just wanted to make you aware of the fact that if you're having any difficulty with the audio portion of today's presentation, you may always choose to dial in and listen via telephone. So if your computer speakers are inadequate or if you're having some difficulties, just dial this phone number, enter the access code, and you'll be immediately connected to the audio portion of today's webinar. Likewise, if you are listening via telephone and you lose the connection, all you have to do is re-enter the telephone number, enter the access code, and you'll be immediately reconnected. This information, the telephone number, and also the access code will appear at the bottom of each of the slides. And remember, if you have other types of difficulties, you can always contact us or you can call technical support at 866-569-3239. I'd also like to take just a moment to show you the best way to ask questions. So as you will notice in the upper right hand corner of your screen, uh, there will be a little icon that's called Q&A. Now Q&A, it may be a box, it may be a circle, usually has a little uh, question mark in it. When you click that, a box appears in the lower right hand corner of your screen. So if you would like to submit a question to Dr. Teitelbaum, then just type your question in this small box, press send, and your question will appear up here and we'll start a list. So everybody who submits a question, that question will be entered in this list. And when we get to the end of today's presentation, uh, Dr. Teitelbaum will go through those questions in the order in which they are received. Additionally, where you will also notice that there is a chat box. The chat box is two-way communication. It's not the place where we're going to list our questions. Chat is for use for two-way communication if you're having a technical problem and need to contact the host. So if you are having a technical issue and need to contact the host privately, just open up the chat box, select to whom you wish to send your message, and send it our way. If you do ask a question or if you do have a problem and you're waiting for assistance, uh, using the chat box, please monitor that chat box because that's the only way we'll have to communicate back to you. So now it's my delight and my pleasure to introduce to you somebody that I uh, respect tremendously as one of the thought leaders in the integrative medical world, and that's Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum. Dr. Teitelbaum is a board-certified internist, and he's also the medical director of the Practitioners Alliance Network. He is the lead author of four groundbreaking studies on treatment for chronic fatigue and uh, fibromyalgia and every single one of his studies has been found to have some effective interventions that make a real difference in the lives of people that are suffering with these diseases. Uh, he's the author of many books. We haven't the space to list all of them, but I want to point out a few from Fatigue to Fantastic, Pain-Free 123, and also The Fatigue and Fibromyalgia Solution. He's been fe featured in publications. He's been on the radio. He's been on TV. He's been on the Dr. Oz show. He's visited with Oprah and friends. Uh, he has spent a great deal of his professional life trying to get the word out that there are indeed effective ways that you can deal with this devastating syndrome. He is known as a chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia insider because he had this problem himself when he was in medical school. He had to drop out of medical school in order to recover, and because of that, they didn't even have a name for the syndrome when this struck him. Uh, he has spent the rest of his life dedicated to finding answers for these problems. And so without further ado, I want to introduce to you Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum. Welcome, Dr. Teitelbaum. Cheryl, great to be with you and with everybody today. So. For those of you who have fibromyalgia, who have Lyme disease, or have both, 
we're going to give you critical information and a really good understanding of what's going on so you know how to get well now. That's what this is all about. And please ask questions. I will stay on until everybody's question is answered unless they throw us all out sooner. So <laughs> ask your questions because that's really a critical part of getting well. You need to know you have the power to get the information you need, and you're going to get that today. So let's start with a simple question. Um, is it Lyme disease or is it chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, ME? And the answer is a key to getting well. And it may not be exactly what you thought. So let's start by taking a little look at effective treatment for fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. And this includes people who have Lyme disease that triggered their fibromyalgia. And not just Lyme disease, but literally dozens of other infections. So does this sound like you? Tired, achy, brain fog, can't sleep. If this sounds like you, you've got fibromyalgia. Now, you can have Lyme disease with it. Many people do. And the way to tell if it's simply Lyme disease or fibromyalgia is the fourth one on this list. Can you get a good night's sleep? If you have severe insomnia despite being exhausted, you also have a secondary fibromyalgia. So that's a key take home point today. You got Lyme disease. If you can't sleep, especially if you're tired, achy, that Lyme disease blew a circuit uh, breaker in the brain called the hypothalamus and triggered fibromyalgia. When that happens, whether that happens from Lyme disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, any of these things. You've got to also treat the secondary fibromyalgia if you really want to get your life back. So let's take a look. If you take a look at Lyme um, disease, Lyme is an important piece of a very big fibromyalgia puzzle. Um, and in, most of you are familiar with the symptoms of Lyme disease. And Here's the thing, so many of you have been given antibiotics and you found, wow, you know, especially I took the tetracycline, doxycycline, minocycline, and my symptoms improved initially. But then they started getting worse again or they plateaued. And what's going on here is the candida uh, overgrowth from the antibiotics dragged you back down again. So if this sounds like you, Antibiotics helped, and then it got worse. And you keep chasing higher and higher doses of antibiotics and different ones, especially if you have nasal congestion, post-nasal drip, <coughs> clearing your throat a lot kind of a thing, or irritable bowel syndrome, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation. Presume that you have candida, either in association with the Lyme or secondary to the antibiotic, because when you treat that, your antibiotics are going to start working again. So the antibiotics, what, what happened in Lyme disease and fibromyalgia is basically got an infection, that infection caused you to blow a fuse. And that circuit breaker is called the hypothalamus. And the antibiotics help clear the infection, but you've got to turn the circuit breaker back on. And the way that you do that is with the SHINE protocol, S-H-I-N-E. We'll talk about that and how you can use that to recover. So let's take a look at our research using the SHINE protocol. Um, in the study, it was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, gold standard design. And half the people got all active, half got all placebo, nobody knew who was getting what till the end. And what we found is that 91% of people with fibromyalgia, including Lyme disease-induced fibromyalgia, got better. They had moderate to marked improvement in their symptoms. And let's see what those numbers look like. Now, this was the title of the study, Effective Treatment for CFS and Fibromyalgia. And what we found is that of the 32 people um, that we had in each group, the half of the people in the active group rated themselves as much better by the end of an average of 99 days. And another 13 said they were better, not cured, but better. Uh, two were the same, one was much worse. In the placebo group, only three people felt much better and nine somewhat better. Most people 
created themselves is no change, as would be expected. <clears throat> now, what was the degree of improvement? We used a visual analog scale. Basically, you ask people on a scale of 0 to 500. Uh, and we used 500 because it's, we had five key outcomes. Uh, those include things like fatigue, sleep, um, whether their overall well-being, pain, cognitive function. And they rated it on a scale of 0 to 100. Um, the average person in both groups started at about 170 out of 500, rating their overall well-being on these five scales. And you'll see that it went up to an average of 310 uh, in the active group, minimal change. So that's a dramatic improvement in quality of life. And so many of you have found that I've taken this, I felt a little better, then bam, crashed again. Because if you're only putting together and uh, strengthening one link in the chain that's weak, you're going to strengthen that and then another chain is going to pop. You've got to treat the whole process. And that's what we're going to discuss today is how to do that. Um, and the two-year follow-up found that by the end of two years, people continue to even get better and better than they had, despite being able to wean off of most of the treatments. So it's kind of like a sprained ankle. You use crutches to allow the ankle to heal, and then you throw the crutches away. We're going to give you a number of tools to help you recover, and as your body writes itself, you can start to throw those tools away. These are not forever in most people. So the study conclusion, and for those of you who have ever published a study, you know that most journal editors will not let you make this bold of a statement unless the data is incredibly strong. The study conclusion, effective treatment is now available for CFS and fibromyalgia. And we have treated thousands of people. We treat people from all over the world, often by phone consultation. And we routinely see people getting their lives back. So let's take a look at some of the symptoms of CFS and fibromyalgia. These are overlapping processes. Uh, we talked about the insomnia, which is a hallmark of the illness. Um, if the person can get a good night's sleep and wake up refreshed, I'd look for other things, not fibromyalgia. The widespread pain. Uh, many of you have found that you have a lot of sensitivities. You're sensitive to most everything. And that's part of the immune system being overwhelmed in this illness. But for those of you who are severe, there's two things you want to look at. There's a wonderful acupressure technique called NAET. And you have the website here, www.naet.com. That is very, very effective at eliminating sensitivities. So the website can give you the name of a practitioner near you. Also, there's another process called mast cell activation, which when treated can help decrease the sensitivities. Uh, many of you find that brain fog is common. Uh, in fact, you're worried, oh my God, am I getting Alzheimer's? The answer is no, you're not. I've never seen this progress to Alzheimer's. Um, you know, in fibromyalgia, it's difficult with short-term memory, word finding names, you know, so you think, oh my God, I don't remember my, my kid's name. It's just a word finding process. Uh, fibromyalgia is when you keep forgetting where you left the keys. But Alzheimer's is not. Alzheimer's is when you forget how to use the keys. You don't have Alzheimer's. And the brain fog clears up with the SHINE protocol along with the other symptoms. And many of you have chronic sinus, nasal congestion problems, irritable bowel syndromes, both candida. Uh, frequent infections, average 32 and a half weight, pound weight gain. And when you ask people how's your sex drive, 73% say, what sex drive? So these are all common symptoms of the process. And for those of you with Lyme disease, sounds a lot like it, doesn't it? Well, this is because Lyme disease is one of numerous triggers for fibromyalgia. As we said, it's like blowing a fuse. That's what fibromyalgia is. It's an energy crisis where when the energy deficit becomes severe enough, you trip a circuit breaker called the hypothalamus. And the question is, well, how can you blow a fuse? Well, there's hundreds of ways. How do you trip a circuit breaker in your body? There are hundreds of ways. And Lyme disease is one of those. 
and it's a very important common trigger for CFS and fibromyalgia. Um, but again, if you just if you blow a circuit breaker because you have too many space heaters plugged in, and off goes the circuit breaker, if you unplug the space heaters, the lights don't go back on. If you get rid of the lime, that's not enough to get rid of the problem. You have to turn the circuit breaker back on. Now, there is no good test for Lyme disease. Um, the tests that are out there either miss most people who have it, or I think tend to overdiagnose a bit. Um, and I prefer to treat Lyme disease based predominantly on symptoms. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. When do you know to give an antibiotic? So those of you who have been treated for Lyme disease, you've seen that initial improvement, often followed by worsening. As we mentioned, this is a critical take-home point. The antibiotics trigger secondary candida yeast overgrowth. And if you don't also treat that, you're just going to go right back downhill. As you mentioned, if you have insomnia too, you have fibromyalgia, that has to be treated. The SHINE protocol will do so effectively. And then when you treat the entire process, the trigger, which was Lyme disease, and then turning the circuit breaker back on, which is the fibromyalgia, you're, you get your life back. And it's really fun to see. I mean, we see this day in and day out for the folks who we treat. They get their lives back. So in fibromyalgia, we talked about it being a body-wide energy crisis. Um, it causes you to blow a fuse, drips a circuit breaker called the hypothalamus. And as we, you know, people ask, well, how can you blow a fuse? What causes a fibromyalgia? And as we mentioned, there are literally hundreds of things, but they tend to fall uh, in addition to uh, the infections. They fall under several key categories, common kinds of things that we'll see. Uh, infections, including Lyme and yeast overgrowth, uh, viral infections, parasites, numerous infections can do it. Other immune issues, such as autoimmune illnesses, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, multiple sclerosis, about a third of people who have those illnesses have secondary fibromyalgia, and it's usually missed by the doctor. And the problem is the treatment is very different for fibromyalgia and autoimmune diseases, uh, and you have to treat both. If you know somebody with Lyme uh, or you know somebody with autoimmune diseases that's doing poorly, give them this information. Hormonal deficiencies. Just another study came out this month showing low thyroid uh, in people with fibromyalgia relative to healthy controls, and despite the blood test still being technically normal. We'll discuss the problem of blood testing a little bit. Adrenal problems. How do you tell low adrenal? Not by the tests. You tell low adrenal because you get irritable when hungry. It's called hangry. Uh, food sensitivities, toxins, uh, nutritional deficiencies, stress, disruptive sleep. These are all uh, common triggers for the illness. So we talked about the circuit breaker that goes offline. It's called the hypothalamus. Here's a little uh, picture of it. Not very helpful, so we'll go on. <laughs> so what does the hypothalamus do? You know that if you blow a fuse in your home, trip a circuit breaker, you go to the circuit box and see, oh, number 17 is flipped off. And you look at the panel, what does it do? It says control living room lights, da 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 da, -da has a list. So if you go to the uh, control panel of the brain and you say, what does the hypothalamus do? That circuit controls sleep, which is why you can't sleep even though you're exhausted. It controls hormonal function, temperature regulation, and also autonomic function. That means blood pressure, pulse, sweating, bowel function. Many of you find that your gut is in an uproar or else you haven't pooped for two weeks. Um, you find that uh, when you stand up, you may get lightheaded or you have a rapid pulse. It's called POTS or NMH, all of that is caused by that hypothalamic dysfunction. Uh, why does that area go offline? Because it uses an enormous amount of energy for its size. And therefore, when you have an energy crisis, it goes offline first, acting as a circuit breaker. Interestingly, this is not a something broken in your body. This is your body's attempt to take you out of the game during an energy crisis uh, and prevent you from spending energy you don't have, which could cause much more dangerous long-term harm. 
like a circuit breaker, it's really, really annoying when it goes off, but it protects the rest of the home from any permanent harm, which is as you get your life back and feel healthy again, will turn out to have been a good thing that it did that. Now, people ask, why do I have the pain? Whether you have Lyme disease, whether you have fibromyalgia, you're gonna be in pain. And that's because as the energy goes down, it's interesting, muscles require more energy to relax than to contract. Now you think, that doesn't make sense. If I'm gonna, you know, lift something heavy, it's gonna take more energy to do that than it is to let the muscle go. But yeah, biochemistry, that's not so. Muscles are like a spring. Stretching them out and relaxing them is where it takes the energy. You release that energy as the muscle contracts. Um, and if you think about it, when you come home after a few people have a hard workout, they don't come home and say, honey, my muscles are so loose and limp. They're so tight because the energy drain in the muscles causes them to get stuck in a short position. Understanding that helps to get pain free because if you realize your pain is predominantly coming from the muscles being locked in the shortened position. And when they get stuck in the shortened position, they hurt. And you'll find that if you stretch those muscles, say you have a massage or something like that, or a chiropractic adjustment, they feel better for a couple hours, maybe a few days. But then that low energy causes the muscles to go right back into the shortened position again. And there you go, back to the pain again. So the key to getting good of the pain is to restore energy production so the muscles can release. Now, most of you know that there's many kinds of pain in fibromyalgia and Lyme disease, and there's seven key types of pain. Um, you have the muscle pain is what it starts with, then it triggers uh, nerve pain, small fiber neuropathy, brain pain called central sensitization, uh, gut pain, migraine headaches. You'll see this whole progression of different kind of pains. When it gets really severe, even light touch to the skin called allodynia. Um, each of these pains is different and requires a different treatment, but all of them, all of them, all of them can be effectively treated. There's no need to be suffering with pain. It's really unnecessary. So as you go through this process and looking to understand, why did I blow a fuse? What caused the energy crisis? If you had a sudden onset, we can tra track it to about 50 months of time. You want to think about infections, especially if you had a tick bite with a classic rash, uh, if you had a flu-like onset, if you were traveling and came down with Montezuma's revenge, you want to think parasites, uh, and there's a host of access to infections. Uh, also with sudden onset, um, you want to think injury. Uh, Post-injury fibromyalgia is common. Or postpartum, people do well during pregnancy, but after they deliver, the, all these high hormones during pregnancy suddenly disappear and it's like somebody pulls their rug out from under you. And so postpartum to, uh, fibromyalgia is common. If you had a gradual onset, it's more often gonna be things like low thyroid, low adrenal, perimenopause, nutritional deficiencies, a yeast or candida from excess of antibiotics. Uh, Lyme disease can sometimes come in very gradually too. It really varies from person to person. Autoimmune diseases, uh, lupus, for example, sleep disorders like sleep apnea, restless leg, or severe stress. Uh, your body doesn't distinguish between the stress of an infection and the stress of living with an alcoholic or an abusive uh, family member. So all of these put a drain on the body's energy reserves. Now, people ask me, what's a nice Jewish doctor like me doing in a field like this, you know, treating holistically and treating fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome? And the answer is, well, had it. <laughs> you know, uh, when I was in medical school, I came down with a nasty viral infection, what I called the drop dead flu. Uh, the blood test showed that there was a severe infection, but they couldn't, and viral infection, they couldn't identify what it was. And six weeks later, I was still pretty much uh, non-functional near bed bound. Um, and when I didn't get well, after a while, the, the professors figured, well, it must, he's just a depressed med student. They call it depressed med student syndrome. Um, but since I was paying my own way through medical school, 
uh, I couldn't work, uh, and I, I had to drop out of medical school. Uh, I couldn't pay my rent, and I found myself homeless sleeping in parks. Um, and it's funny how the universe always gives us everything we need. It was as if somebody put a homeless, holistic medical school sign on my park bench. Um, naturopaths came by, herbalists came by, chiropractors came by, energy workers came by, physicians came by, and each of them taught me bits and pieces of the puzzle that I needed to learn to get myself well. And back then, there wasn't even a name for this condition. Um, and I was able to recover, went back to medical school, did honors, did great. Um, and I've spent the last four decades with a simple goal. And that goal is making effective treatment available for everyone. And that's why I'm here today. Uh, I don't take money from any pharmaceutical or natural product companies. And all my royalties go to charity, things like that. It just, uh, it just keeps it cleaner. And people keep asking, why am I traveling over 100,000 miles a year, many years, um, all over the world, lecturing and teaching and being on the media? It's easy because I got well. I know how what a bear this disease can be. And I've seen it go away in thousands of people. And the most fun thing in the world for me is giving you this information so you can get your life back. And I'll tell you, people say, well, what amount of sacrifice you make. Because three quarters of the time that I spend is unpaid, is teaching. Um, I say there's no sacrifice here. This is the most fun thing in the world. So let's look at how you can get your life back. We talked about you blew a fuse, and uh, whether that was triggered by Lyme disease or any of a number of other things. Uh, you, you address five key areas that need to be treated to make the problem go away. And write this down. If you don't have a piece of paper, just write it on your forearm. Write down the letters SHINE, S-H-I-N-E. This is a protocol. This is your roadmap to recovery. You want to optimize sleep, optimize hormonal function, address all infections that need to be treated, and those are different, totally different from person to person. Give optimized nutritional support and exercise as able. Now, you'll notice I added the word at able, as able. Some idiots out there say, well, just exercise. Well, ignore them. They're fools. You already know that if you do too much exercise, you can be wiped out for three days. It's called post-exertional glaze. And some people are saying they're kind of make-believe you're crazy because it's just exercise. And like, they're idiots. Ignore them. The bottom line, though, is for any uh, problem, cancer, cancer-related fatigue, it's been shown that reconditioning exercise is critical. Nobody would dream of saying, oh, well, you don't have cancer, then you're just crazy. And it's no different for this disease. It's a very real physical disease. But maintaining conditioning as able is important. So we're going to go through a lot of things because this is, you have to put the whole puzzle together. You have to take care of the whole process. And even though we treat people, my new patient consults are three hours long, and not everybody can afford that. So what we did was we made a simple tool. Uh, I actually hold the U.S. patent for a computerized doctor um, because I realized I can't reach 50 million people worldwide with this disease, but online the computer programs can. So we have a, a free quiz online. It can analyze, uh, go through symptoms, the whole thing, um, and you don't need to have the blood test, but if you have lab tests, you can put in the pertinent lab tests. It'll analyze those as well. And it'll tell you exactly what's draining your energy and how to optimize energy production. It's called the Energy Analysis Program. We used to charge for it, it was $400, but we told people that, you know, if you couldn't afford, we'd let you do it for free. And 80% of people wrote back that they were impoverished from the disease. Um, and my wife and I decided we'd just make it free for everybody. So this is my gift to you, the free Energy Analysis Program at Vitality101 or 101.com. Um, it's step three on the page. Go ahead, just do that. It will tell you exactly what's sapping your energy and ver give you a very detailed protocol for optimizing energy production. Um, so you don't have to write frantically today. It'll pick up all of that. So let's take a look. Is, do you just have Lyme disease? As you mentioned before, the key question is, 
can you get a good night's sleep? If you have insomnia, despite being exhausted, you have secondary fibromyalgia, the Lyme disease. Um, so the question is, shine includes eye for infections. What makes me decide to give antibiotics? Well, in those people who have chronic low-grade fevers, meaning anything over 98.6, is there joint swelling or redness? Do you have a history of vertigo? Uh, many, if not most people with fibromyalgia and CFS have dizziness, but it's more like the dizziness of standing on the deck of a ship that's moving in a boat. Um, it's not the spinning around in a circle, passing out and throwing up kind of dizziness. That feeling of spinning in a circle, that's vertigo. And if you have that, then I'm going to consider uh, that Lyme was a trigger and give the antibiotics. Now, a number of infections can trigger the vertigo, including some viral infections. And if I see a Bell's palsy, where half the face goes paralyzed for a while, I'm going to be going with antivirals and antibiotics both. Does that person have a feeling of chronic lung congestion? I'm going to give antibiotics. Do you have scalp scabs, these little scabby things on, on your head that you keep picking at? I'm going to go with the Zithromax or erythromycin. Or, and here's one of the most telling things that the person has an a, a, uh, antibiotic sense of infection triggering their fibro. Do you have a history of being allergic to multiple unrelated antibiotics? Now, people come in and they say, I'm allergic to tetracycline, Cipro, and Sulfo, and nothing else. Those aren't allergies. Those are three chemically totally unrelated compounds, and that they're allergic to all three of those, and not much else. They may have sensitivities, but not the medication allergies says that that wasn't allergies to the antibiotics. Those are called Herxheimer reactions. That is a reaction that's called die-off reaction. Now, when you kill the bugs quickly, your body has to get rid of all these dead body parts of the bugs. And the dead body parts of the bugs can trigger that reaction that you had that your doctor said, oh, that's you're allergic. So the key for that is to go with very, very low dosing of the antibiotics, start really slow, and do a good detox program at the same time, and just slowly ease up the dose as is comfortable. So let's take a look at the N in SHINE, because N stands for nutrition, and optimizing nutrition is critical to health. Um, people ask me, what vitamin and mineral do I need? And the answer is all of them, by definition. And there are over 50 uh, critical ones that have been stripped out of our diet and food processing. Now, one of the first things that I helped design uh, was a vitamin powder. I got really tired that people had to take handfuls of pills all day to get the basic optimized nutritional support that they needed. Um, and I designed a powder that you take one drink and it replaces over 35 pills. If you think I'm kidding, uh, try getting it what's in the one drink. Uh, and if you can get it in less than 35 pills, I'll give you 100 bucks. Most people, it takes them 60 pills or so to do that. Uh, it'll have 50 key nutrients, including malic acid, other energy cofactors, inositol, amino acids, vitamins, high dose B complex, minerals. It's, it's easy. Keep your life simple. It's cheap, simple, one drink a day. And you're going to find, you're going to, most people find they're feeling a good bit better just from that. Another key nutritional thing, because our diet has lost most of its omega 3s because of food processing. And optimizing omega 3s, which we think of as fish oils, are critical for balancing inflammation, optimizing brain health, and optimizing mood. Um, but the problem is, to get enough of the omega-3s to really be clinically effective, people have to take eight big hunker fish oil pills each day, which is nuts. And then they're burping up fish oil all day. And every time they burp, every cat in the neighborhood has their nose going up like an infield fly. And it's like, no. Um, get a vectorized omega-3. Because if you do that, one pill a day replaces eight big fish oil pills. 
again, you're going to find a big focus of mine is making this easy for people because there's a lot of things that need to be done to put the whole system back together again. So use the right stuff to make it really easy and effective for you. Um, and the fish oil is funny, not just as a balance inflammation, but it's, it's really helpful for mood. If you find that they're depressed or got the blues, uh, they asked me to write a textbook chapter for the main nutrition textbook for students in the United States at most universities. Um, they're the two main ones. And they asked me to write the, uh, the chapter on uh, psychological disorders. And it's amazing how many studies uh, show that a good proper form of the fish oil can make all the difference. Other critical nutritional advice, you want to increase your water intake. Now you're going to say, I'm already drinking like a fish. And yes, you are, but you're peeing like a racehorse. The hormone called antidiuretic hormone or anti-peeing hormone that holds on to water is low. And because of that, you leak like a colander. You look, you know, it's like a bucket with holes in it. And you, if you stop drinking, you're just going to get dehydrated. So you need to drink a lot of water. And you need to increase your salt intake. And that should be on the slide. So. Um, Restricting salt in this disease is a good way to crash and burn. You have trouble holding out to salt and water. Increase your salt intake as well. Got a good crystal sea salt, but really any salt is just um, make a massive difference in how you feel. And avoid sugar intake. Sugar is toxic in this disease. Uh, it aggravates uh, the candida. It aggravates the low blood sugar problems because it, it puts you on a sugar roller coaster. So increase water, decrease sugar, and increase salt. Uh, people ask what diet will feel best, and the answer is it really varies from person to person. And I suspect one of the reasons we have such a wide variety of foods to choose from um, is that each of us needs different things, and even the same person needs different things at different times. So the way to tell us what leaves you feeling the best, not just immediately when you eat it, but long term. Generally, what your body asks for is what it wants, except for sugar, because that's been, it acts, that acts like a drug, so it gets into a craving problem. But most of you will find that you do best with a high-protein, low-carb diet, where you have multiple meals through the day. Now, the vitamin powder gives you what should have been in the diet at optimal levels, but there are certain things that our body makes that are not found in the diet and that you need to take separately. Uh, three wonderful nutrients for optimizing energy. One is called ribose. The other is acetylcarnitine. Uh, the acetylcarnitine just takes for three months. And then coenzyme Q10. Uh, take 200 milligrams a day. Uh, take it with food. The ribose, you don't want to get the capsules because it's 30 uh, pills a day. You want to get the powder. And you want to take one five gram scoop three times a day. What we found in our study of 257 people at 53 doctors' offices was that one scoop, five grams three times a day, and it looks to taste like sugar, but it's a yeast can't eat it, and it doesn't fill the blood sugar off. It actually lowers it just a touch. Um, but the after three weeks, energy went up an average of 61%. Uh, sleep. 29% improvement, uh, brain fog improved, pain went down overall while being 37%. That's from one nutrient. So that's what I do each morning is a vitamin powder, my fish oil, a special highly absorbed curcumin, and the ribose. That's my morning regimen. Um, so for anybody, I'm going to use ribose for anybody with chronic fatigue, fibro, chronic pain, chronic Lyme, or cardiac conditions. Um, Exactly. We just mix it in food or water. Uh, twice a day is plenty for most people. I just take it in the morning myself. But after, after you're feeling better for six to nine months, um, you can go from twice a day down to once a day. Uh, most often you'll seek effects by one container, three weeks, um, but take it with the vitamin. The main side effect is that it can be overstimulating, increase energy too much in some people. Um, if that happens, you want to give adrenal support, and we'll talk about that in a moment and then lower the dose of ribose. Um, so the optimizing nutrition, critical, and it's easy. You're, you're going to find what I just described is not a handful of pills. It's, it's basically one drink 
and maybe three or four pulls a day. Now, let's take a look at sleep. You want to be sure to get a good night's sleep, and you can't because the sleep center is not working. So you can lie in bed for 24 hours a day, and you're just going to lie there. You can't get to sleep. Um, but it's critical to get your good, solid, at least eight hours sleep a night uh, for it to heal up. So how do you do that if you can't stay in sleep because of the fibromyalgia? Uh, many of you find you have trouble falling asleep or initiating sleep and also trouble staying asleep. You wake up, you know, this is if the universe has a 2 a.m. alarm clock that goes off and wakes you up every night. And you can see this in the night sweats, low blood sugar, a host of different things. And these are all easy to address and treat. So a good way to begin, you know, you want, because of the drop in blood sugar, um, if you find you wake up at 2 in the morning frequently, um, try eating a hard-boiled egg before you go to bed, a one-ounce protein snack. It can be some meat, cheese, fish. See if that decreases the frequency. If it does, it suggests you have a drop in blood sugar that's going on. Um, but I like to begin with herbal mixes. There are several uh, that are very helpful. They help relax the muscles, decrease the pain, uh, improve sleep quality, and keep you asleep. Uh, there's a mix of essential oils, uh, mandarin zest oil, lemon balm, which also has antiviral effects. It's, a, it's nice thing about herbs. With medications, you get all these side effects. And with herbs, you get all of these side benefits. So you have the antiviral effect of the lemon balm. Um, you've got Ravensara, uh, leaf oil, lavender. So there's a mix of essential oils. You can get them all in one capsule. Nice, simple thing. Um, and then there's a mix of uh, other herbs and nutrients, uh, passion flower, 5-HTP, valerian hops, theanine, lemon balm. Um, and again, you can combine these. You, 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 the more lemon balm, the better. Um, so these two together make a wonderful uh, herbal sleep combination uh, to get a start at getting sleep. But no one or even two treatments are going to be enough uh, to overcome the problem with disordered sleep uh, in fibromyalgia. You're going to need probably four or five different things. And I like using a mix of herbals uh, combined them with very low doses of specific medications. Uh, and because if you use a high dose of one medication, you're going to be hung over the whole next day. Where if you use very low doses of several things, the herbs, you can take a full dose, medications at tiny doses, you get the, most of the benefit at the low dose, and you're not hung over the next day. But let me give you one really, really cool thing. That's a relatively new uh, herbal. Now, echinacea say this is older than we are, yes. But there's this one special component of echinacea. It's a unique component um, that has really unique properties. And those properties are that they're as effective as Valium for anxiety and they help sleep with no hangover, no addiction, all natural. Um, and anybody who has sleep issues or even if they, it's not from anxiety, um, I take this myself in the evening because I still take the herbals uh, for sleep. Uh, it's just Even when people recover from their fibromyalgia, I recommend they stay on the vitamin powder, the ribose, and just something for sleep. So and I follow my own advice, even though I feel great. So um, I would use a special form of echinacea. You, you can't get it at most, you know, if you just healthy stores. But um, it's 20 to 40 milligrams, uh, one or two pills, an hour before bedtime. And then you can take it twice a day for those with anxiety. It takes six weeks to see the full effect, but it is wonderful. If you have anxiety, go for it. If you have trouble sleeping, add this into the mix. Um, some other natural sleep aids, uh, a little bit of calcium can help at bedtime, but it needs to be uh, magnesium. Magnesium is much more effective than calcium, 100 to 300 milligrams. Main downside of the magnesium is it can cause loose stools, so lower the dose if that's a problem. Melatonin, one half to five milligrams. Um, as you mentioned, do the uh, one ounce uh, protein snack at bedtime, like a hard boiled egg is an easy way to do it, and see if that helps stabilize your blood sugars at night. 
the way you'll tell is you won't wake up wide awake as much if that's the case. You'll know in the first two days of doing it if it's helping. And then, especially, you know, in this time of year still, a good hot Epsom salts bath about a half hour before bedtime will relax you and your muscles, decrease the pain, and help you ease into sleep. Um, you want to take two cups of Epsom salts. They're easy to find, they're cheap. Um, Epsom salts and magnesium salts, put them in a tub of hot water, have a nice soak. And what I would do, pour yourself, if, you're, if your body is okay with the alcohol, sometimes people with candida have trouble tolerating alcohol, pour yourself a little bit of wine. It's okay. I mean, a lot of wine will disrupt sleep, but if one glass isn't going to, it'll help you fall asleep. Um, have a little bit of chocolate or get the best tasting one you can or something else that's a reward time. This is a reward for making it through the day again. Light some candles, put on some relaxing music, and soak. This is part of your bedtime routine. And you know, for those of you who have kids, it's important to set up a routine that kind of tells the body, okay, we're ready to ease into sleep. And, you know, as adults, we're really just big kids. And having our own bedtime routine really does help the body shift from that adrenaline mode into the rest and go to sleep mode. And this is a very good way to do it. And the Epsom salt bath makes a nice difference with that. Um, and then again, I will use very low doses of several different medications as needed, add it to the natural remedies. Start natural and then add on the medications as needed to get your eight hours of sleep a night. Now, let me ask, share a fun little tidbit. Um, anybody guess what the average night's sleep was in the United States until 135 years ago? How many hours a night on average people got? Nine hours a night was the average night's sleep. What happened 135 years ago? Light bulbs. <laughs> so if you're needing your nine hours, that's, that's funny, because I, I, Dr. Oz and his wife are friends of mine, and you know, she had mentioned, I want to mention this, she said, I need my nine hours sleep. She was feeling like a sleep glutton because she needed her nine hours. And to hear that, that's normal. And it is normal. See the amount of sleep that leaves you feeling the best aim for that. Now, let's take a look at hormones. That's the H and shine. Uh, hormones are produced by glands. They're basically our body's communication system. Uh, the thyroid hormone is our body's gas pedal. The adrenal is a stress handler and then there are reproductive hormones. The reproductive hormones are critical, not just for reproduction, but critical for energy, mood, sleep, and a host of other things as well. Now, what you see in fibromyalgia is that circuit breaker that controls the hormone system, called the hypothalamic pituitary axis, is offline. And it's important with blood tests. And this is, a, I'll give you an analogy of Dr. Oz asked if he could run with that home go for it. Um, do you know where the normal range comes from on blood testing? Well, here's a shock. Most doctors don't either. I'll lecture to three, four, five hundred doctors at a time. And I'll ask who here knows how the normal ranges are derived. And unless they've heard me talk before, no hands go up. And one day, I, I was wondering, you know, when I was early in my medical um, career, where the hell do they get these normal ranges? I had presumed, and we were given to understand, though nobody said it, that you have committees of wise, old, elder doctors with long white beards who would sit there and look through all the research and say, well, if it's in the range, there's probably no problem. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. You take 100 people, and you apply what's called two standard deviations. What that means is that the 95 in the middle, you test 100 people, the 95 in the middle of the normal range. So if I wanted a normal range for shoe sizes, I'd check 100 people and I'd get a normal range of 5 to 13. Now, can you imagine, you know, I live in Hawaii and, and I, we live on an active volcano and we don't want to track the lava in, so, you know, people leave their shoes at the door. Can you imagine? So we both leave and say, you know, I and this other gal leave the house and uh, we got our shoes mixed up, and I'm wearing her size 8, and she's got my size 13. And we go to the shoe doctor, and the shoe doctor, she says, the shoe is too big. He looks at it and says, no, honey, it's a size 13. It's a normal range. There's nothing wrong with the shoe. 
and I say it's too small. He says, no, Jacob, smack dab in the normal range. It's, it's an eight, you know, five to 13 is normal. Nothing wrong with this shot. I say, my toe doesn't fit in the damn thing. And he'd look at me like I'm crazy and just send me out. How many of you had that experience? Go and get your thyroid and the other hormones checked. So hormonal deficiencies are common despite normal blood tests. How do you tell? You tell by the symptoms, not the blood tests. And then you treat the thyroidenical hormones. So let's take a look at thyroid. What are the symptoms of low thyroid? Tired, achy, weight gain, cold and pallor. Sounds familiar? I'll treat with armor thyroid, and I will give iodine six and a quarter milligrams a day. This is also critical for optimizing thyroid function. Weight gain, uh, a study in our research center showed the average weight gain, 32 and a half pounds. And you can help promote weight loss. It's impossible to lose weight just by trying to diet and this disease. Just the problem is that the metabolism is off. So optimizing thyroid and adrenal, acetylcarnitine, 1,000 milligrams a day helps a little bit. Treating the candida, getting eight hours sleep a night. You know the studies show over and over. If you don't get enough sleep, you gain an average six and a half pounds and have a 30% higher risk of obesity because you make growth hormone during sleep that causes us to turn fat to muscle and treating insulin resistance. So these are the keys to addressing weight gain in this disease so that you can start to get back to yourself in many ways. Um, so let's look at adrenal. Adrenal is a stress handler. Chronic stress, whether it's physical stress or situational stress, um, we live in an environment where instead of news, you have what used to be have the news half hour a day, they give the news, here's what's going on in the world. And it's changed from that to 24 hours a day. And they try to make everything a crisis and put everybody at each other's throats to get people to stay glued to the TV set for 24 hours a day so they can sell advertising. And if you look at the five major news networks, you're going to think around five different planets. So at least four of them are mm, wrong. And I'll give you a clue, all five of them. Oh, what's the medical term, FOS, full of stool? Anyway, it's nonsense. But it does constantly leave people feeling like everything's a crisis. And it contributes to adrenal burnout. Uh, so turn it off. You're not going to be uninformed. How, how did Mark Twain put it? And I said, if you don't watch the news, you're going to be uninformed. But if you do watch the news, you're going to be misinformed. Okay, turn it off. You know, uh, your adrenals will thank you. So how do you tell if you have low adrenal? It's very simple. Do you get irritable when hungry? It's funny. They coined the term hangry and try to sell candy bars, which is the worst thing in the world you can do. You'll feel better a half hour after, a half hour after, an, an hour hour and a half later, you're going to be even worse and hangrier. Um, but it sells candy bars. So anyway, but if you get hangry, irritable and hungry, you need adrenal support. Um, if you get that way, tell your loved one and your, you know, those people close to you, when I get irritable, do not hug me, do not try to reason with me, do not any of that. Just feed me. And then you'll feel better. <laughs> so you'll save yourself a lot of marriage counseling and divorce lawyer bulls up. I make up a little card. So when I get irritable, just feed me. Uh, but when you do the adrenal support, that goes away. Uh, frequent infections. You find every infection comes by, you get it, it takes forever to go away. You treat the adrenal, suddenly you go through the winter with no infections, everybody else is sick. So that adrenal support, really big thing. So how do you support the adrenal function? There's a wonderful mix of you know, all of these in one capsule. That's pregnenolone, and we find that a very large percent of people with fibromyalgia have low pregnenolone levels on their blood tests. Vitamin C, panathenic acid, licorice, which slows your body's breakdown of cortisol and makes your own cortisol last longer and has again, antiviral side uh, benefits. Uh, many uh, adrenal extract, a little bit of DHEA, L-tyrosine, all of these in combination, amazing adrenal support. So, and then for the, how do you tell if you need estrogen or progesterone? Uh, if your fibro symptoms are worse around your menses. I'm not talking about PMS stuff, I'm talking about the poor sleep, fatigue, headaches, that kind of stuff, worse around your menses. Uh, you probably need estrogen support. Men, most men will need 
testosterone support. Uh, 70% are in the lowest 30th percentile of testosterone. So with Lyme disease, uh, we talked about how Lyme is an important trigger. Um, but, it's, but there are many other infections that also, Lyme is really important. And there's other things, though, that you don't want to miss. So we talked about candida. And again, I suspect about candida in virtually everybody with fibromyalgia. And I'm going to just go ahead and treat it. And the way that I treat it uh, will be with a good probiotic, um, avoiding sugar, and I'll use antifungals, but I will use some medications if you can. And there's a compound, a sinus spray, that can be very helpful. But what are the symptoms of candida? Tired, achy, weight gain, cold intolerant, brain fog. So how do you tell apart from fibromyalgia? Well, it also causes chronic nasal congestion, uh, sinusitis when it gets severe, and gas bloating diarrhea or constipation. So those are the hallmarks. And you'll find that the chronic sinusitis and the irritable bowel syndrome go away when you treat the candida and sometimes other bacterial infections uh, as well. So you want to look for and treat these other infections. Uh, viral infections, antibiotic sensitive, yeast parasites, Lyme is one of many. And again, I'm going to treat predominantly based on symptoms. I'm going to have a high index of suspicion. Now, let's wrap up by looking at pain and just a few other quick things. Um, if you want the pain to go away, you need to understand pain is not an outside invader. Pain is part of our body's normal monitoring system saying that something needs attention. It's kind of like the oil light or warning lights on your body dashboard. And if you give your body what it needs, the pain goes away. It's just like if you put oil in the car, the oil light goes out. What do you do medically? You go to the doctor, say, my this flashing red light's annoying me, and they smash it with a hammer. <laughs> That's no. You know, I wonder why pain is so poorly treated in this country. No, you put oil in the car if the oil light's on. You know, you treat you you need to give the body what it's asking for. So there's many different kind of monitoring warning lights. And there's actually people say, Well, how do I know what it is? There's a nice app called Cures, C U R E S, capital A dash C. C like zebra. Uh, so Cures A dash C. It's a free app. There's a two buck upgrade if you want. Um, and for iPhone, Android. And it'll, you can look up anything from A to Z, acne to zoster, and look up each kind of pain. It'll say, here's what's going on. And here are the best of the natural things and even the medications to make it go away. So what's my favorite pain reliever? Um, there's a mix of a special, highly absorbed curcumin combined with Boswellia, DLPA, and autokinase that addresses the immune system. Uh, inflammation is, is too narrow a word for it, but many different things. Uh, all these different immune pathways are affected and balanced by the special highly absorbed curcumin and Boswellia. Uh, this mix has been a pain relief miracle for people. Um, the problem is if you just use curcumin, it doesn't work unless you take about you know, 30 pills a day because it's not absorbed very well. Um, it'll work a little bit. But the what opened up this whole area of curcumin research for me was a study that showed that if they add turmeric, the turmeric essential oil, to the curcumin, uh, you increase the absorption sevenfold. So um, we're and, and if you just took a regular turmeric pill, it would take 350 to 500 of those to get the same effect of one of these special curcumins. Uh, so if you want a pain relief miracle, uh, again, that combination is all in one capsule. That's curcumin, but that special highly absorbed one, Boswellia, DLPA. Uh, DLPA is kind of like a way of increasing the body's own endorphin pain molecules and natokinase to break up the inflammation. When I first tried this, I thought, no, oh, maybe it'll be a little helpful. And six weeks later, people, and it takes six weeks to see the full effect. It takes a half hour for it to start to work. But it keeps building and building and building in effectiveness. You can take it with any other pain medications. But I had people on that the morphine wasn't helping and just make the pain go away. It's just really, really good. Give it six weeks, see what it does for you. Um, I would also, for special areas of pain, get a topical comfrey cream that you can rub over the area of pain.
Um, and then, as you mentioned, there's several, there's seven key kinds of pain. We're not going to go through all of those. That's another talk. But the brain pain or central sensitization is a key part of the pain once the pain has become chronic. So interestingly, the antibiotic doxycycline and minocycline have been shown to markedly decrease central sensitization brain pain. Another uh, a medication you can get from compounding holistic pharmacies is called low-dose naltrexone. It takes two months to see the effect of that. So again, these are just a several of many things you can do for pain. Many of you have low blood pressure. Uh, you tend to get exhausted and brain foggy when you're upright. Um, email me at fatigue.doc at gmail.com, the address is on the slide, F-A-T-I-G-U-E-D-O-C, at gmail.com. I'll send you a free two-minute quiz that will screen for orthostatic intolerance, which is present in a large majority of people with fibromyalgia, and give you information on how to take care of that. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, because we're getting near the top of the hour here. Uh, mind, body, let's wrap up. Uh, all illnesses are a combination of both physical and um, psychospiritual components. They all well, they have multiple sclerosis, which is associated with the repressed rage, which is why people, the illness is so sweet. Uh, ovarian cancer with a helpless, hopeless personality. Um, the mind-body thing, think about what that would be, look like for an energy crisis. And basically, uh, and this is not for everybody, but for many people, it tended to be low self-esteem as a child, we were approval seekers. They are trying to be all things to all people. Uh, we weren't able to say no. People ask us for things where we should have said no. Our gut was saying, say no. And we said yes, you know, because we wanted to avoid conflict. And we take care of, we're overachievers who take care of everybody except who? Ourselves. So the people ask that I go for counseling. Well, <laughs> that's, you know, it's like any other disease. If you have cancer and you're having trouble coping or you need some some help coping, sure. So when do you go for counseling in this disease? You don't go for counseling because the doctor's an idiot and hasn't taken time to look at research and says, I don't know what's wrong with you, so you're crazy. You go to counseling if you feel like it will be helpful. It's really straightforward. But you want to be careful. You know, people tend to go into what they have. I have my cardiologist found a heart disease, gastroenterologist found a lactose intolerant. I do chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. I had that. And my psychiatry friends tended to be crazy. At least they were. Some of them have done brilliant work and, uh, and self-work, and they're now outstanding people. But many, if not most of them out there, are, are still just kind of crazy. So you want, if you go for counseling, be sure that psychoanalyst is one word and not two. Again, you want to make sure just that it's just that, you know, it's, that they're not crazy. And you'll know by how it feels. So there are some other natural things that can be helpful, massage, acupressure, although acupressure and acupuncture are too weak by themselves. They're very good techniques, but in fibromyalgia, um, the main thing is that they can help release the trigger points. Uh, manipulation, chiropractic, uh, herbals, nutrition, CBT. Uh, the problem with cognitive behavioral therapy is that the way that it's done is, and this is only in fibromyalgia, you have some crazy people I'm not going to name names, to basically have said, well, you know, counseling helps, you know, learning coping skills helps, and therefore people are crazy and they don't have a real disease. They don't say that. They keep denying that they say that, but, but they do that. They push for laws, and it's just nuts. So CBT, the way it's described for fibromyalgia, is toxic. But if you go to somebody who's not part of that group and system and mindset, who does CBT, who can just teach you coping skills for pain and sleep, that can be helpful. And NAT, an emotional freedom technique, can be helpful. Uh, for uh, The EFT is very good for releasing old traumas. For those of you who are PTSD and things like that, uh, the EFT and a book, Waking the Tiger by Peter Levine. Uh, for those who want more information, uh, if you want more of kind of almost like a textbook, my, the classic from fatigue to fantastic will make your fibromyalgia expert. If you want more of an easy read, and it's a good way to begin, you can start with the fatigue and fibromyalgia solution. And then if you want it more in depth, you can get the uh, fatigue to fantastic. Um, again, I'm happy to help you get your life back. 
I treat people worldwide, very off by phone because people are too ill to travel. Uh, if you want to email me at the fatigue doc at gmail.com, uh, happy to give more information. And go do the free energy analysis program. That's step three at vitality101.com. So www.vitality101.com. It will it'll take you 10, 15 minutes to do the quiz. It'll, it'll get a list here of the things contributing to your low energy. Here's what you need to do to optimize energy production. And this way you can get your life back. So tooth, chronic Lyme, and fibromyalgia are now treatable. And uh, so it is. And we've, I saw it myself in my own case and treating thousands of people. So I am happy to stay and ask questions. Cheryl, I'm not sure. I don't see the questions on my screen. So no I worries, don't... Dr. Teitelbaum. We'll get those, uh, those questions to you. I see quite a few. Um, mm -hmm. Shall we get started? And, but before we start, I do want to thank you. And I also want you to know that there are several, several messages that I've received, both publicly and privately, in both the Q&A and the chat boxes, thanking you so much for such a wonderful presentation and for um, uh, all the wonderful and valuable information that you've shared today. So thank you. Uh, now, are we ready pleasure. to get started with some questions? Let's do it. Let's go time. All right. Let's, let's hop in. Here's a person who said that she was tested many years ago for Lyme disease because of her fibromyalgia, uh, but it, it came back, oops, my question just lurched a little bit, excuse me. Um, hmm. Sorry, I started to read that. And then the question, we've had some a few technical difficulties, the, techn the uh, question disappeared. So let me try that again. Well, well, let me talk about testing in general. All right, why don't you? Because the standard testing that you do at Western Lab called Western Blot and a screening will miss the majority, probably the large majority of people who have fibrom who have Lyme disease. And this is from the British Medical Journal, so that doing the blood testing is no more than a coin toss. Some other tests, I almost never see anybody come back negative. And I suspect that if I tested 10 healthy people in my drug cap and my hub cap would come back positive. So I, I've kind of shied away from that. The test can be helpful, and especially if you're dealing with doctors who say there's nothing wrong with you, all the tests are normal, it's, it's helpful. Um, but in real life, I prefer to use those symptoms that I gave, or if the person simply, if they have a history of feeling better after taking an antibiotic. It's funny how many people come and say, I had this infection, I took this in my five miles, and went away for two weeks, so I was taking it. Well, then keep taking it. <laughs> it's like, so I'd like to use clinical symptoms and response to treatment, to guide treatment. Uh, I find it was more helpful than testing. That's just my own personal style and approach. Excellent. Um, so for individuals who are tested for Lyme's disease and they come back negative, then they should probably look into following the fibromyalgia protocol. Or and I know that they you still need to be considered for Lyme disease. Right. That they're negative doesn't mean they don't have it, Cheryl. Right. So that they might be working with their doctor for a trial anyway to see if it has improvement, and if not, then they can move into the fibro protocol? Yes, or do it all together. All right, excellent. Now, I do have a lot of questions, um, folks, that you've asked about specific products, about ordering products or about uh, products, but we try really hard in our Terry Talks Nutrition webinars to just try to stick to the educational aspects of using nutrients for integrative health uh, without turning it into something of an infomercial or sharing specific product information. If you do have some questions, feel free to contact us at uh, terrytalksnutrition.com. There's a place there where you can ask specific questions. You can also send us an email at info at terrytalksnutrition.com. Any of these ways you can contact us if you have specific questions about where to get products or what products to get. Um, all right, here we go. Here's a person who um, says they have menopause and fibromyalgia uh, and chronic fatigue syndrome. The best way to handle the sleep problem, she wants to know, and, and not flashes and weight gain. I apologize. I've just got a few words here. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess I'm wondering if are there special considerations when your concerns are compounded by menopausal issues? Absolutely, because the drop in estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, even in women for the testosterone, 
can significantly trigger and worsen not just the sleep, but the fibromyalgia in general. It's especially women who've had a hysterectomy. Uh, the doctor will often say, well, you don't need progesterone for the menopause uh, because you have no uterus and you're not going to get uterus cancer. But progesterone isn't just there to prevent uterine cancer. Um, the progesterone is critical for sleep. So even if a woman has had a hysterectomy, I do recommend the bioidentical uh, biased for the estrogen, progesterone, and if the testosterone level is not in the upper half of the normal range, I'll add a milligram or two of testosterone. So I think it's really important to go ahead and you know, do the, a trial of the bioidentical hormones. And then I'll also go with the natural remedies and even the medications that we talked about. Excellent, excellent. Um, here's a person who wants to know if, uh, would you recommend the licorice even for people who have high cortisol if they have other problems with adrenal function? Yes, because the here's the thing. I, I won't use the licorice if the person has high blood pressure. And most people with this illness have low blood pressure. When I see high blood pressure in this illness, I'm going to screen for sleep apnea. Um, with the high cortisol, often the cortisol is higher than normal, but still not high enough for the stress that your body is facing, often from infections or inflammation. Um, and then the question arises, is the symptom coming from cortisol being too high or not high enough for the stress? And the way that you tell is I'll give a, uh, the adrenal support or even a little bit of bioidentical uh, hydrocortisone to see if the person feels better. If they feel better on the hydrocortisone, then their body needs a little more. Um, and I'll give the adrenal support plus that. If on the other hand they feel worse, then that tells me, ah, well, the cortisol is too high causing, and that's causing a problem. Then I'm going to give ashwagandha at most the phosphatidyl serine. I give about 100 milligrams of phosphatidyl serine to 200 milligrams in the morning. Um, but what I'll also do is if the person's mind is wide awake, many of you will find your adrenal is low during the day, but too high at bedtime. Most people need to run a cortisol of 18 in the morning and under two at bedtime. So it goes both ways. If it doesn't drop enough, uh, at bedtime, you're going to feel like your mind is wide awake at racing at bedtime. And then the phosphatidylserine, about 100 to 200 milligrams before, an hour before bedtime. Uh, and maybe some ashwagandha with it can be very helpful. Um, so these are the probes, the way that we tell. We give the adrenal support, a bioidentical cortisol, do you feel better? Okay, then that says you need more. If not, that I give hospital serine predominantly and see, okay, does that feel better? And both during the day and at bedtime for sleep, some people just need it at sleep time. Um, so this way, the best way to tell is not by the blood test, but it's how your body, the symptoms your body has and how it reacts to treatment. That tells you much more effectively what's going on. I've heard the mantra, treat the person, not the numbers. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got a question. Do you, have you ever used, or what do you think of using Artemisia for Lyme's disease? Good. Well, it's good for parasites, and there's so many co-infections, the Bichiosis, the others, uh, that may be sensitive to the Artemisia. It's a very reasonable treatment Excellent. in addition, Excellent. but not, not as a primary. Okay. Um, stevia, okay. interestingly, the raw stevias mm -hmm. have been shown to have uh, effectiveness, the ones that are all clouds uh, and kind of thick. Um, haven't shown to have effectiveness against Lyme also. There's many things that uh, help suppress the different bugs. There's some very good protocols out there, even all natural ones. Mm -hmm. Another question, is there a topical form of ribose or do you have to take it orally? No, you have to take it by mouth. All right. And it's well tolerated by mouth. Most people find it's really easy on the, on the system. And you can always use a lower dose. Um, mm -hmm. The main problem with the ribose is that if your adrenal is low, it may drop your blood sugar a little bit and make it uh, hyper. In this case, that just tells you you need adrenal support. Go on the adrenal supplement, then back on the ribose. 
Um, here's a person who has had years of post-nasal drip. Is there anything you can do to help her? Oh, God, yes. Treat the candida. And there's a sinusitis nose spray. Uh, you can get it compounded. Uh, ITC Pharmacy uh, does it by mail. You can email them, and your doctor can call it in at his prescription. Um, the nose spray, uh, combined with treating the candida, will usually knock out the post-nasal drip. Now, once in a while, you'll see a deviated septum that's causing it, and then that. Uh, so, but first, I'm going to treat the candida. Then, if it persists, then they get the septal repair. But the vast majority of people, like over 95 percent, will find that you treat the candida, use a nose spray, address allergies with NAAT, and then surgery as a last resort. Well, that's that's really informative. I hadn't heard of some of those before. That's that's interesting. So we um, still te keep teaching each other the new things. Excellent. <laughs> hey, uh, we got another one from a person who is uh, taking a thyroid hormone, WP one thirty milligrams daily. She wants to know if she can still take iodine, and if so, do you have a, a yes. dosage recommendation? Six and a quarter milligrams. Okay, so six point two five, right? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Let's see. Um, here's a person who said they recently heard that Lyme's disease can be contagious between people. Is that true? Oh. No. Mm -hmm. Don't bite them and stick your tongue in some like mosquitoes. <laughs> oh. No. So it's a it's a tick-borne disease, but you don't pass it yeah. from person to person. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, yes. It's funny, you know, all this stuff goes on around Facebook and the internet and stuff. One of the the internet is great at giving information, but it's horrible at giving perspective. If you have a freckle and you go on the internet, you're gonna be convinced that you're gonna be dead of melanoma in a year. I mean it's just yeah. So I've been doing this for a long, long time. I've I've gone through probably over a hundred thousand studies and treated thousands and thousands of people and I'm very good at giving perspective. So if I can help in that way, I'm happy to. Here's a question on pregnenolone for adrenal support. What do you recommend as a starting dose, and, and how long after you've been on it would you expect to see any benefits? The benefits are more in the background. It's not like some things like the adrenal product, people like within two weeks are going, oh my God, this is outstanding. The pregnenolone is in the background to just help support uh, the production of the other hormones. So it's not one of those things that gives a wow effect, but it makes it easier for other things to give that effect. The nice thing about the adrenal product is that it has the pregnenolone in it. As part of about six, seven other things, it's just all there. Mm -hmm. So it's supporting the background. If I'm giving the pregnenolone separately, there's no widespread agreement on dosing. It's anywhere from 10 milligrams a day to 15 milligrams twice a day or even higher. Um, but I think for many people, just starting with that 10 is a good place. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and one last question that came in. Here's a person who has a multitude of issues going on. Uh, she has CFS and fibromyalgia, suffers from insomnia, has many food allergies, is hypersensitive to a lot of things, and doesn't seem to handle supplements very well. Uh, yep. What would you recommend for the insomnia and so that she can sleep till morning? She supposes her cortisol is very high at night. And she also that, says, yeah. and, and, and a little bit more information, that her symptoms are worse at ovulation. She, at that time, she also gets nauseous, uh, some vertigo, and extremely anxious. So you have the mast cell activation, which should be addressed. And you can begin with quercetin, which is a bioflavonoid, 500 milligrams, uh, five, uh, taken twice a day, an antihistamine, uh, many of the over-the-counter antihistamines have sedating ones for nighttime, not sedating ones for during the day. That can help the sensitivity reaction along with doing the NAET because that decreases many of the food and other sensitivities so your immune system can stand down and not be so overreactive. Uh, the phosphatidylserine ashwagandha combinations uh, at bedtime for sleep will tell you very quickly whether the high adrenal is an issue or not. Um, ovulation, the estrogen and progesterone drop with ovulation, just like they do around the, the menses. And so when you have people, especially they get migraines uh, around the periods or around ovulation, or they just feel worse in general, uh, the bioidentical hormone replacement as a vaginal cream is the way that I find works the best. 
uh, can be very helpful. And some people cycle it. I, once the woman's 45 or higher, I don't. I just give it every day. I don't cycle it. Have you ever heard of using um, DIM, diendolomethane, for mm -hmm. uh, people that are having some of these symptoms yes. when there are sudden um, estrogen progesterone drop-offs? Yes, and they can be helpful. Um, I prefer the bioidentical estrogen, uh, progesterone, testosterone, and then I'll add the DIM if needed to help stabilize that. Excellent, excellent. Uh, let's see um, if I've missed anything. Since we did have a technical issue for a while, the screens, at least on our ends, uh, had some issues and weren't um, displaying all of the questions and answers. So we, they, thank goodness, come back. And, okay, and I do have a Facebook page in case there are any questions that weren't addressed. I do take questions on my Facebook page Excellent. as well. Excellent. What's your Facebook page, Dr. Teitelbaum? I think it's Jacob Teitelbaum, MD. I'm not okay. sure. How's that right. for out? I don't even know my own Facebook. You know page. what? One of the so, one of the benefits of having a slightly unusual last name is there cannot be that many very many Jacob title bombs on Facebook. Exactly. T E I T E L B A U M. <laughs> and uh, I think it's Jacob title bomb M D is just what it goes by. So Right. So they can just ask you their questions specifically there if they have yep. some questions. And and I was I was just notified that another question came in. Uh, Jennifer, what was that question? Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> Can Lyme's disease or dengue fever lead to rheumatoid arthritis? Probably not. Um, there are, even though rheumatoid, and dengue I'm not familiar with, so I'm going to pass on the dengue part. Uh, but the, um, the Lyme disease triggers a lot of things, but it can cause joint inflammation, but I've never seen it cause rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, on the other hand, there's a, a number of really solid studies showing that doxycycline or minocycline, the antibiotic, helps rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and because of that, the theory was that the joints, the immune system was reacting to an infection that looked like the joints and the joints were innocent bystanders and that. But it could also just be that it helped the central sensitization brain pain we talked about. Um, so I don't think that Lyme triggers rheumatoid arthritis. I can trigger joint inflammation. Uh, but I do routinely in people with rheumatoid arthritis. I talked about that herbal mix uh, with the curcumin and Boswellia, which in a head-on uh, blinded study was shown to be as effective as Celebrex or more for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and I will use the doxycycline or minocycline, actually. Uh, there's a the person who asked the questions about uh, the symptoms worsening at ovulation and the many food sensitivities um, had a further follow-up. Um, she said that did she understand that you were recommending estrogen cream, but you were saying bioidentical, meaning um, specific doses of no. estrogen, progesterone, and potentially even testosterone. Is that what you were saying about that might be useful for her? Uh, the vaginal uh, cream and it's uh, bioidentical doesn't relate to the dosing. Okay. It relates to the form. Uh, it's important to understand that to be able to uh, patent a medication in this country, unless you have a new way of giving it, it has to be a, a chemical that's never been seen on the planet before. Uh, it has to be new so you can patent it. If you try to patent regular progesterone or estrogen, you can't because it's old. You know, mm -hmm. It's not something new. And if you can't patent it, you can't charge what the drug companies charge or put it through the $2.9 billion FDA approval process. So it's just because of a quirk in our system that they have to turn it into a new molecule. That's not the same thing that your body has wanted to use or wants to use so that they can sell it. Uh, bioidentical means it's cheap. And it's the same exact molecule that your body has had there for your whole lifetime. And those, the studies show, are much healthier. Uh, it's just the drug companies don't use them as much because they're not as profitable. Mm. The follow-up question, uh, and I think this is our last one in the list, has to do with what about wild yam cream for progesterone? And <laughs> You know, the concept of wild yam or dioscoria getting converted enough, that's, you know, wishful thinking, close your eyes, wish on a star, and hope it doesn't. 
But it is true that there are progesterone creams on the market that you can buy over oh, the many. counter. You just Absolutely, need to look, those work. If you're in the United, <laughs> if you're in the United States, you need to look for one that says a certain percentage. It's standardized to a certain percentage of progesterone, yes. and that U.S. They usually say it's U.S.P. Uh, progesterone. But the problem with the wild yam cream, my understanding is, is that while they may use yams uh, to create it in a laboratory, that that process doesn't happen in your body. Exactly so. I, you, you said it much more elegantly than I did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. All right. So I am glancing through. I got so, uh, some other messages. Um, thanking you so much. It says, greatly appreciated, Dr. Teitelbaum. I find My your pleasure, presentation everybody. easy to understand. So lots of wonderful comments. I hope that you will come back and join us again. And, because every time you're with us uh, for any of our Terry Tux Nutrition webinars, regardless of the topic, you always provide such useful information that can make a real difference in people's whole, whole lives. Well, everybody, thank you for coming. And again, you can get well. You really can. This is a really, really treatable disease. So use the information. Use the tools. And But one thing I want to finish with, Cheryl, mm -hmm. as you get better, don't use your, energy, your newfound energy to go back to what made you sick in the first place, or your body will shut you down again. If things don't feel good, say no. Use your energy to do things that feel good, not what your brain is like you should do, which is your programming as a kid. Listen to your gut. How does it feel? If it feels good, use your energy for that. If not, if things don't feel good, I want you to learn to say one simple magic word. No. And no, there's a great t-shirt that said, what part of no didn't you understand? It's a complete sentence, very versatile. <laughs> All so right. So use this to get a life you love. That's what this is about. And then it will have made it totally worthwhile, which it already is for you to be here. Oh, well, thank you. Then, thank you so much. Fun. Thank you. <laughs> hey, folks, if you want to have friends that you think, wow, they would really love to have seen this webinar, uh, or if you'd like to see it again, there's two places you can find it. You can come to the Terry Talks Nutrition website where there's a list of our uh, recordings of past seminars that have been done. There's also a place where you can ask your specific questions. And while you're at that site, you can sign up for a free weekly newsletter on natural health interventions and uh, motivational thoughts. You can also find us on YouTube. So there is a Terry Talks Nutrition channel on YouTube, which has a broad selection of webinars, both long and short, on a wide variety of topics. And this will be uploaded probably within about 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so if you would like to listen again or if you have friends you'd like to refer, please, we'd be honored if you visit us. Thank you again, Dr. Teitelbaum, for sure. all of your wisdom. Can I say one other quick thing? Absolutely. Um, our study, our foundation is beginning a study on a new treatment for stuttering. If you or anybody you know stutters, email me at fatigue, F-A-T-I-G-U-E, doc, T-O-C, at gmail.com if you're interested in being in the study. The study can be done by telephone. And we All found right. the treatment to be very effective, so we're excited. That's interesting. I will certainly ask around uh, here as well if there's anybody who knows someone. Is there an age limit? Is this for adults, children, or both? Um, we're going to keep it for over 10 years old at okay. this point. All right. And uh, if the person does not have high blood pressure, they can be in the study. Excellent. Excellent. Good to know. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Teitelbaum. We appreciate it. We hope you'll join us again for another Terry Talks Nutrition webinar. And until that time, good health to you. Bye-bye.